And that's what we do. We help business owners build a legacy, achieve their dreams, and make an impact by creating passive income from real estate. And so, yeah. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Conner, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority, and it's on this podcast that we talk about how to raise money, private money, for your real estate deals without ever having to ask for money. Well, I've got a very, very special guest today. He has raised only $15 million, and of course, I put only in quotation marks. He's raised uh, over $15 million in private money, but his career did not start out like that. Actually, he was a former medical device sales rep before he got into this world of real estate. And so now he is annually managing $22 million, actually more than $22 million of new first time home buyer housing and what's called build to rent communities. Now he's been featured uh, in all kinds of publications of, for example, he's been featured on the cover of REI wealth magazine, realty 411 magazine. And in addition to that, he's been published in Forbes magazine. Well, in just a moment, you're going to meet my very special guest. We're going to talk about raising private money. In just a moment, right after this, you're going to meet Mr. Brandon Cobb. Brandon, welcome to the show, man. Jay, it's an honor to be here. That's an exciting introduction. If you don't get jazzed up after that, I don't know what can get you jazzed up. Well, I tell you what's going to get the audience jazzed up is your story, man, because you've got quite the interesting story. We're going to dive deep here in a moment and talk about how you've raised private money, your favorite ways to raise private money, uh, because that's what a large part of our audience wants to hear about. Another part of our audience wants to know how they can just be passively investing. And so you might have an opportunity for them as well. But first, the audience and I, we want to hear your story on how in the world do you go from being a medical device sales rep to developing $22 million of new construction every year? Yeah, it's something that didn't happen overnight, right? If you told me 20, I don't know how many months ago it was, eight years ago, back in 2017, that we would be inventing these new communities and helping the people that we help. I'd have looked at you like you had eight ads because I actually loved what I did. I was in uh, medical device sales, did orthopedic sales. I was the guy, if you had like a sports related injury, knee, shoulder, I was the guy that you go to and you put some kind of anchors or ACL stuff or allograft tissue into your rotator cuff or like your ACL reconstruction surgery. And that was really what I wanted to do for a living, Jay. I didn't have this passion to be an entrepreneur like a lot of people, young guy. I just wanted to get a career where I could eventually work my way to freedom, make my parents proud. I didn't want to be tied down. And I wanted to build some kind of or extraordinary life with no regrets, right? You know, that's kind of what we all want. And so I, I followed the traditional path. I played it safe did everything my parents told me I should do, got a highly desired job, you know, for working for a large corporation, you know, had the company car, the 401k benefits. Uh, they told me to save my money, not spend it. And, and that's what I did. And it wasn't until I got sat down one Friday over at the Starbucks in Weston in Nashville, Tennessee, coming off, I kid you not, the, the best day that I could have possibly had in medical device sales before I could even tell my boss how great of a day that I was having and give him all the exciting news, he fires me. Mm. And let me tell you, that was the biggest shock because I loved my job. I loved what I did. That was my dream job. It took me years to break into that industry. And so like a lot of people who climb a corporate ladder and they're very passionate about what they do and they, they end up getting let go from, from the job, you know that it's a lot more than that. It's not just you losing a job. 
you're losing your sense of self. A lot of people's identities are attached to that career. And when you, that gets taken from you, your identity kind of gets taken from you. And so I had a lot of soul searching that I needed to do. I was no longer <laughs> employable. And I said, let me give myself a six month ultimatum here. And worst case scenario, I can just go jump back into the career and I can do it. And so during that six month period, I started a online motivational blog thinking that, you know, I'll inspire a bunch of people. It failed. I started an online course on how to break into medical device sales. It failed. I also started a um, life coaching program. And, you know, funny thing, no, you, you'd think that 26 year olds, people would be tripping over themselves to take life advice from a 26 year old. Not the case. Couldn't get anybody to give me. So I had these three businesses that just completely flopped. They completely fell. But real estate was the first thing that really took off for me. I discovered this vehicle. I started investing in real estate. I did over 187 transactions over a seven year period. And it was tough initially. It was tough wearing all the hats, figuring out how to hire people. It was really tough being out using all of my own money. I literally sold all my retirement accounts for me to fund my first fix and flip project. And it wasn't until, you know, two years into it when I'd blown through all my savings, all my retirement accounts and racked up $80,000, I'm sorry, $98,000 worth of credit card debt, that that's when the learning really started to take place. And I was able to start taking the steps to invest my money in online education programs, uh, mentors, coaches, you know, a lot of stuff that, that you do and your audience gets a lot of value from. I started investing in me. And that's when things started taking off. And so things transitioned from me, you know, fixing and flipping houses. We built that business up to doing about 30, 40 fix and flips per year to getting into new construction ground up. And we were doing about 30 new builds a year. And it wasn't until we really hyper focused and realized like, oh, my gosh, it would be so much easier to build all of these homes in the same exact one or two or three areas as opposed to being spread out and having 30 new builds within, you know, 20, 30 minutes uh, all over the place from one another. That's when we realized that that's what we wanted to do. We noticed that there was a huge opportunity specifically in entry level housing, we just kind of sort of happened upon it, right? A lot of people are listening to the news. They know there's an affordable housing crisis. They know that interest rates have gone up. It's been tough, but we kind of learned that our superpower was working with the local municipalities to identify the vision for the community. And then we helped them make that happen. And so when we pulled a chair up on the same side as the city and said, Hey, what do you guys want? What's lacking? What do you guys need? and didn't try to show up and just shove something down their throat, they were so much more amenable to what we were going to do. And we realized that we could force appreciate the value of the land. Basically, we turn farmland into entry-level housing communities. That's what we do. And so we build all this equity into the product before we actually purchase it. We've got a process that we use. So it's been a it's been a seven, eight year journey. It definitely did not happen overnight. And I could not have told you eight years ago that I would be, you know, getting to do the cool things that I get to do. And, and, and now I've I've got a pretty cool life where I get to travel a lot. I think about six weeks off per year. I do an annual mom son trip. We always go somewhere historic. She's a retired history teacher. I go to places that, you know, my dad would never, you know, be able to afford to go to if it were just himself. And I do these annual sibling trips every single year. So real estate for me has been a tool to, you know, unlock that freedom that I know that we all desire. I wish you had uh, known about private money um, before you went blew through your savings and your credit cards. But you know what? When I look back at my life, I got a ton of mistakes. I've lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I remind myself every now and then it's what you went through that got you here, mm -hmm. but what you went through won't get you from where you are to where you want to go <laughs> because we're continuing to learn all the time. Um, so listening to your story, it sounded like you began your real estate investing journey with fix and flips, right? It's like your first mm -hmm. project was a fix and flip house. I suppose that was a single family house. Yep, that's exactly right. Sold all my retirement accounts, paid the penalties, bought it cash, was driving an hour and 20 minutes every single day to GC this house myself. Mm. I was getting the contractors off Craigslist, which don't do that. That's the worst possible place to get contractors. <laughs> and meanwhile, I was managing this project. Well, I didn't know which way to swing a hammer. I did not have a construction background. 
but I was all in. I was saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to figure this out. And I actually hit that six month ultimatum eight days before it was up. And so I made about $30,000 off of that house flip and said, well, I made some money by myself. I guess I got to keep going. There you go. You said you didn't know how to swing a hammer. I've, I, I was getting ready to say I've rehabbed over 500 houses. I haven't rehabbed the first house myself. My team has. Yeah. Uh, so we've done over 500 houses. I still don't know how to swing a hammer. I don't want to know how to swing a hammer, yeah. but uh, I have an amazing team that does it. So you started out in rehabs. Um, I started out in rehabs. I still do about, you know, 30 a year or so um, in a small market here. Our market's only 40,000 people. But you started out in rehabs, but then you migrated to new construction. In your story with the municipalities, it sounds like the uh, cities and municipalities was actually more directly your customer. Uh, that is the people you're going to serve initially mm -hmm. to ultimately, uh, you know, serving or, or to your product going to the buyers. So what was it what was it that triggered you or motivated you to move from the rehabbing space to new construction yeah so two jumps there first jump is rehabbing to the actual infill spec new construction so think of that as like onesie twosie projects you tear a house down and you build one or two in its place and then the second step up is working with the cities and doing these larger developments, basically turning farmland into actual communities. That first step happened when we had a house that we had purchased for less than what the land was worth. Half of it was burned down. That second story, it was crispy. But that foundation and first story wasn't looking so bad. And so we hired a structural engineer. We brought the city out and said, hey, look, let's do this the right way. We cut out all the black stuff, you know, reframed and we built that house. We basically built a new house using the existing foundation and some of the existing framing on the first floor. We felt comfortable because we had done these full gut rehabs where we gutted everything down to the studs before. And we ended up selling that house in six months. At the same time, we were rehabbing a historic full gut rehab right around the corner that took eight months. And we made probably $40,000 on that full gut rehab. And we made $120,000 on that new build. And that was the light bulb. We made three times as much money building new as we did rehabbing. And that's when we said, what are we doing flipping houses? Now there's some other reasons I kind of go into. We were tracking a lot of our key performance indicators at the time. And we were flipping houses for $250,000, making 50 grand off of them. Very good margins there. We were spending about $3,300 per contract per acquisition. And we had just noticed over time, over you know, a four-year period, our, our, our KPIs were telling us that we were spending $6,600 for every deal that we acquired. And we weren't flipping $250,000 homes anymore. We were flipping $450,000 homes and making $30,000, $40,000. And so the writing was on the wall. Things were saturated. We knew we wanted to you know, not keep going in that direction because it was getting more and more competitive. And new construction just happened to be the tool, the vehicle that we noticed at the time that we were like, wow, three times as much money with less time heck yeah let's do this and so that's how that manifested itself and then the problem with the new construction was you're spread out right you're it takes just as much time to talk to one person who has one house where you can build you know one or two homes on it as it does to talk and negotiate with somebody that has a piece of land that you can build 100 200 homes on right and there's a lot less competition for those deals and so our second pivot happened when we knew we wanted to do bigger deals and we started talking with the city and we realized, holy crap, you can make a lot of equity appear in a deal when you take a home from farm to a 100 home community. There's a lot of equity that gets baked in and we can do that before we ever purchase the product. It's like being able to fix and flip a house and buy it after you fix and flip it and all the equity is there. Yeah. So instead of flipping a few houses simultaneously, you're in your new construction, you've like scaled your business to where you can do a lot more houses <laughs> simultaneously than you can finding a deal over here or finding a deal over there. It's mm -hmm. been my experience, um, you know, over the years and, and I've, I've been blessed to interview a lot of people, but it, 
with all the stories that I hear, it seems to me there's a common thread among real estate investors. There's before private money, and then there's after private money. There's life before private money, then there's life after private money. And it seems as though, and I'm just curious to hear your story, Brandon. It seems to me that a lot of times there is a pivotal moment or there's something that happens in the real estate entrepreneur investors career that there is a light bulb moment or there is something that changes. Mm -hmm. And that person says, you know, I need to learn about private money and I need to start raising private money yeah. instead of doing things the way I have been doing. Um, what happened? What motivated you to start raising private money? There's two big events and it's kind of funny. I don't think anybody's actually ever asked me this question before, but I can tell you right off the top of my head, there's two moments that come to mind. The first moment was when we realized we were not going to be able to scale our business with hard money. And so when you're fixing and flipping properties and you're going to events, there's people who will actually give you money. It's pretty easy to get money to, for a fix and flip project. In fact, if you flipped a couple, you'll probably get letters in the mail from hard money lenders trying to give you money to flip a house. But there's a difference in what I call hard money and private money. Hard money is expensive. It's typically anywhere. I, I mean, I've got friends that do hard money loans and they charge three points up front and like a 15% rate. So in order to get $100,000 from them, you got to give them three grand and you're going to pay them $15,000 in interest over the course of a year and you're going to pay monthly payments. And we were doing a lot of hard money loans while we were fixing flipping and even doing, you know, some of our new builds. And we just realized that we were not going to be able to scale using hard money because the monthly interest payments were too severe. It was too much. It was too much strain on the cash flow of the business. Real estate is a cash flow management game. You have got to be able to manage the cash flow or you will go out of business. And so we knew that we need to go raise money at more affordable rates. You can raise money for fix and flip projects at 10% annual interest all day. There's people, your friends, family, whoever that will pay that all day and they'll be excited about it because they're used to getting seven or 8% in the stock market or two, 3% in a CD or whatever. And so we also negotiated where there's no monthly payments. And so like we, we've got like $20 million development out. You know how much I pay in interest every month? Sounds like zero. Zero. None. Zero zilch, not. I've got no monthly payments, which means I can sit on these things as long as I need and stomach things like a COVID crash or interest rates going up because there is no, I've got holding costs, but you don't feel it every month. And so that was important to me. I've realized we were not going to be able to grow and scale our business using hard money. We need to go raise private money and we needed to have the interest payments accrue to sell it. Then I realized after several years of doing that, I was raising dollar for dollar, meaning if I needed 300 grand to go buy the land and build the home, I need to go find $300,000 from an investor or, you know, whoever. And I, and I had, I think at the time I had like, I want to say like six or 7 million bucks out. And I'm like, it's like paying, playing Tetris. You might have somebody who has $200,000, but you need 250. And so you got to go find someone else with 50. And then you got to do a first position loan and a second position loan. And it gets, you know, it gets kind of squirrely. You don't want to do that. And so the problem is you spend all this time and effort raising the capital and taking care of the capital and, 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 you know, having it perform. And then if you get a deal and you don't have an investor with that exact same amount of money, they go somewhere else. It's a problem. And so it's like playing Tetris with people's money like that. Then I discovered the power of a syndication and I discovered what equity was. And boy, let me tell you, this is when things really took off. I learned that we could take those investors and instead of having debt positions, we could convert their capital to equity. And then we could use that money to go and leverage and get debt and use that to be able to really exponentially grow. When we did that, I mean, let me tell you what, things really took off because I was able to have these conversations with investors and go, hey, look, um, how would you like to come in instead of being a debt position, be a partner in the deal? And instead of making 10%, you know, if we could offer you 18%, would you be interested? And boy, they jumped at that because I'd had a record. I'd done a lot of deals with these people and they trusted me and I had the performance to show that we were going to be able to perform. And 
let me tell you, I woke up. It, I mean, literally, we converted that six million bucks from debt into equity. I woke up with fifteen million dollars that I could go and do deals with, and that's when things really started to take off. Because I realized at the time, oh my gosh, if I want to go and you know do three hundred homes a year, you know, do all this development, I, I was going to have to go from six million to like. 40, $50 million. I was like, how the hell am I going to do that? That, oh my God, I see how much work it takes to go raise 6 million bucks. If I got to go raise dollar for dollar, what happens? And so now overnight, that problem went away because we're able to raise equity and use that as leverage to go and get deals financed. So let's dive down a, a little deeper on that, just to make sure that everybody is listening, uh, understands. So what you said was overnight, you went from 6 million. That was the private money you had already borrowed. And that was debt in, in a debt position where they were earning interest or accruing interest. But then overnight you went from 6 million to 15 million because of an equity position. Explain that uh, a little bit more. Yeah. So if you go and you buy your own house that you want to live in, the bank or whoever is doing the deal with you is going to require a down payment. So if you're buying a house for, let's say a hundred thousand dollars, you got this nice house, you're going to buy it for a hundred thousand dollars. You go put a contract in on it. You're probably going to get a loan on that house and the bank is going to loan you money, but they're going to want you to have some skin in the game. And so because you've got some skin in the game, they're going to want a down payment. And so this is usually you taking the money, $20,000. Usually it's 20%. You can get an FHA loan due, you know, three, four, five percent or whatever. And you put that money down in exchange, they'll finance another, the other $80,000. So in this example, I would go to investors and say, hey, look, I need to borrow the down payment. I've got the financing lined up. I've got the bank or, uh, you know, the other private entity, you know, lined up that's going to lend on this, you know, and I would raise the down payment. That's equity. So that's cash. And so what we would do is we would create these LLCs. Basically, it's a, syndi a syndication. Fancy way of saying it's crowdfunding. You're pooling money together and you're giving people an ownership percentage of the deal based on how much capital they contribute. So you could have 10 people in the deal. And if they all contribute you know, the same amount of money, they'll get the same distributions when it comes time to sell whatever property it is. Or you might have somebody that brings half the, the money or, you know, the other person that brings 25%. And so how much money they bring influences what percentage of the limited partnership that there are. And so it, you can think of it like a jumbo jet. I like the jumbo jet analogy. You can't just pay one ticket and be the only person on a jumbo jet to go and get to where they want. You have a bunch of people that contribute a small amount. They buy their own separate tickets. This way they can fill the plane up and together you can all get to where you want to go. That is what a syndication is. I love it. I love the explanation, Brandon. Um, now, what have, what have been some of your favorite ways to raise private money for your either syndication or when it, when it was, you know, just all debt. So there's been a whole journey, right? You start with friends and family. I think everybody's familiar with this model and you basically take a list of people and you write all the people down and you call them and you need to say something along the lines of, you know, I'll kind of, I don't know how far down the rabbit hole you want to go on this. Like we can go into each one. I can go, Hey, here's the strategy and what you need to do. If you want to call your friends and family, I can do that. We can go over how we're raising money from accredited investors online. We can go over how we're generating referrals from like our current investor base. So like you tell me how far down the rabbit hole that you want to go. When I first started, it was friends and family. And so right, I would pick well, up the phone. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, do I'd the pick friends up the and family. phone. Yeah, I'd have a deal we already did. So create some kind of investment packet that shows the details of all your past deals that you've done. Or if you haven't, a deal that you're going to do. Go look up online what a pitch deck looks like. Copy and paste that. And then I'd call my friends and family. And here's the important thing that you want to do. Do not say that you have a deal. And I want to pitch you the deal. It's the worst thing you could possibly do. Call them up and you say, hey, um, you know, getting caught up with you. Great. Hey, look, I want to pitch an idea to you. Uh, you know, I've been doing this real estate thing for a while. It's been going really, really well. I think at some point we might have an opportunity to bring in more investor partners uh, for our deal. And I don't currently have anything, but if I were to find something, are, are you interested in investing in real estate? Is this something that you'd like to take a look at? 
because it puts them at ease. You're not trying to put them on the spot. And if they say yes, that's perfect. Now they've given you permission to contact them when you do have something. And another way that you can um, do this, if you do have a deal and you need to like immediately pitch it, is you don't ask them for uh, the chance to like pitch them a deal. You ask them for advice. Hey, I got this good deal. I got this real estate deal that I'm working on. I, I'm, I'm looking for some feedback on it. I want someone to like shoot some holes in it. Would you mind taking a look at it and just giving me some honest feedback and shoot some holes in it? You know, let me know what you think it's lacking. You're not asking them to invest, but it's a way of getting the deal in front of them. And you let them give you the honest feedback on the deal and then ask, okay, cool, great. So this is wrong. This is wrong. Okay. Anything lacking on this, anything that you felt needed to be in this presentation, anything you felt was missing. Okay, great. Thank you for the feedback. Hey, by the way, do you know anybody who might be interested in learning about investing in this deal? And you'll be surprised because they'll probably say like, yeah, actually, you know, I, th I thought this was a really good deal. I I'm interested in it. And so that was the first way that I started raising money. And let me tell you, I had a lot of bad conversations and it took me a while to learn to use those two viewpoints right there, those two frameworks to be able to raise money from friends and family via a phone call, text, or email. Well, I tell you, Brandon, uh, you and I have got the same experience. This is why on this podcast, we talk about raising private money without ever having to ask for money. Um, the way I do it is leading with a servant's heart and having on my teacher hat and teaching people, you know, I got 47 private lenders right now, and not one of them had ever heard of private money or private lending until I taught them about it. Yeah. And, and I really want to emphasize the point that you made. The point you made in your story right there was that desperation's got a smell to it. And the worst time in the world to be raising private money is when you need it for a deal, right? So the way I do it is we separate conversations, just like you shared. We talk about our program. We talk about how our private lenders earn high rates of return safely and securely. And I don't have a deal today, but here's how it works. Here's the program. Here's, here's how you're protected. Here's how you can get your money back in case of an emergency. And so in my world, they tell us how much they got to work with, or if it's, you know, retirement funds, and I need to introduce them to the self-directed IRA company where they can move their funds over and earn tax deferred or tax free income. And then when I got a deal to put to, uh, for them to fund, I don't even call them up and pitch them on the deal. I just call them up with what I call the good news phone call. <laughs> and I think I am scheduled to be on your show. So I'll share with your audience what the good news phone call is. My audience already knows what it is. Um, well, let's change gears for a little bit here, Brandon. Thank you so much for sharing what you just did because you and I are singing in the same choir, my friend. Um, I mean, these gurus going around saying, oh, just get a deal in the contract. The money will show up. I want to throw up and go run head first in a brick wall. It's like, <laughs> where's the money going to show up? I say get the money lined up first. But let's switch gears. We've got a uh, we got a percentage of our audience that loves to be involved in real estate, but they don't want to go negotiate deals. They don't want to be the operator. They just want to sit back and make really, really nice returns. So in the time we have remaining, Please tell my audience about HBG Capital. What in the world is that and how does that work? <laughs> yeah. So we're a real estate investment firm that basically focuses on Nashville, Tennessee specifically. And we focus on first time home buyer housing, also known as affordable housing. I don't like to use the term affordable housing just because people confuse it with Section 8 or government housing. And so it's it's the first time home buyer housing. So it's that two thousand to twenty five hundred dollar per month mortgage, and we focus on that because that's what first time home buyers can afford right now, especially after the interest rate rise. It's the most undersupplied, highest demand real estate product in the country right now. You just don't have enough homes that those first time home buyers can get in. And to make matters worse, you've got over thirty three percent of the home buying population millennials mostly that are having kids they're at prime home buying age they want to settle down and they're struggling to afford something 33 percent of the home buying population needs a first time home less than 10 percent of the homes being built are affordable and so i don't need to be a genius to tell you that there's a huge supply and demand imbalance there 
There's a huge supply and demand imbalance for affordable entry level housing. And so that's what we focus on. We go in and we turn beautiful farmland communities into these entry level housing communities. We do it in Nashville, Tennessee. There's a ton of reasons why Nashville, but you just think of it like there's money going into the city. Anytime you can be building and developing in an area that's you know been one of the top 10 fastest growing cities in the United States the past six years, you've got tons of big corporations like Amazon and Oracle, Alliance Bernstein that are moving here and bringing jobs to the area. When you've got a business friendly state that did not shut everything down during COVID, it's attracting literally six billion dollars worth of institutional capital has come into nashville uh, since the COVID area it's getting out of now it's getting out of california it's getting out of new york it's getting out of new jersey all these high tax states and it is flooding nashville so we literally can't keep up with the opportunity we've got over 1500 units in our pipeline there's no way we're going to be able to build and develop 1500 homes or develop 1500 lots and, and sell them to builders and so we're just having to sell off the paper right now to other builders and developers after we get it through the approval process and so we're leaving a lot of meat on the bone and so i'd, I'd say you know the, the biggest differentiator with with us is that we've got multiple exit strategies everything falls under the entry-level housing umbrella but First is we partner with the cities to align and give them what they want. After that land has been approved for 50, 100, 200 homes, and you're ready to go stick a shovel in the ground, three to four things can happen. One is we could just land vacant with our investors. So we own it outright with them. Nobody's going to come and be able to snatch it out from underneath us. We usually do this in an area that's developing. So there's a lot of stuff happening around it. And we know that the price is going to exponentially go up if we just sit and hold on it. Second exit strategy is a national home builder, usually a DR or Lennar Horton, will give us a contract for the improved finish land lots. So these are land, little lots of land that are ready to build. So we go in with our investors capital and we will develop put it in the roads, put in the utilities and the infrastructure to basically create the neighborhood without the homes on it. And then the third exit strategy is we'll go in and we'll actually develop and build the homes. And a fourth exit strategy that has been tough to get the pencil since rates have gone up is the build to rent. And so we actually develop, build, and rent the homes out uh, for long-term depreciation and long-term cash flow. That's our whole strategy in a nutshell. And so then people can invest in your fund at hbgcapital.net and be passive investors and be a part of what you've got going on, right? Yeah. If, if somebody, if you're somebody like we work with a lot of business owners who are really good at business, they're very good at what they do. You know, doctors, lawyers, HVAC, concrete contractors, I mean, you name it, and they don't want to take time away from what they're doing, but they've got a tax problem and they've got a lot of cash on the sidelines. And they know that one day they want to replace their business income with income that is generated by something and nothing's better than real estate. Why real estate? Because it doesn't go to zero. It's not like investing in Blockbuster that did really, really well for decades. And then all of a sudden Netflix comes along and puts it out of business. No, they want something that's going to be around for generations. And so we work with those business owners. We work with those investors to park their capital into real estate, but it's completely hands off. They don't have to worry about finding the deals, managing the deals, selling the deals. They want something that's completely turnkey that they don't have to worry about. They just want to get monthly updates and get very transparent communication no matter what's going on. And that's what we do. We help business owners build a legacy, achieve their dreams and make an impact by creating passive income from real estate. And so, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to our website, hbgcapital.net. It's pronounced Harry Bob Gary Capital.net. We've got a ton of free resources on the website. We've got a free ebook, 100 questions business owners ask before investing. You know, I wrote that ebook because I got a call one day from one of our investors who asked if I would help his friend who lost all of his money in a real estate investment. And after speaking with him on the phone, it became very evident and obvious the reason he lost all his money was because he was very green. He did not know the right questions to ask. He did not know how to secure his investment, how to do the right paperwork. And so I wrote that book and I put that book together because if I could just prevent this from happening to one other person, it would be worth it. And I'm convinced that questions unlock 
the uh, questions are the keys that unlock the answers we need to make more informed investment decisions. So had he had the right answers, he could have done basically prevented that whole capital loss. So you can go to our website, you can grab that free ebook and a ton of other stuff. We've also got our own podcast that uh, that you're going to be on called the Recession Resistant Real Estate Radio. You know, there we interview a lot of entrepreneurs. We talk real estate investments. You can go there and check us out too. That's awesome. Brandon, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the show. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And I look forward to being on your show. There you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host. I'm so glad you decided to join us. And be sure and do me a favor. If you found this episode insightful and you learned some nuggets and some opportunities, if you're uh, listening on one of the podcast platforms, be sure to follow me. Be sure to review and rate and subscribe. And if you happen to be watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out on the upcoming episodes. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.